chapter 53 is going to focus on population ecology. So that picture was showing you the sheep that were introduced on Hirta Island in 1932. Um, because that was a smaller population, it gave, them, um, gave scientists an opportunity to study population size changes. Uh, it was isolated island, had plenty of food, no predators. And we talked about what population ecology was in the previous chapter. Um, looking at populations in regards to their environment, how that can influence their density as well as their distribution, the age structure, and population size. So populations, again, are a group of individuals of a single species that are living in a general area. Um, we define them or describe them more specifically by the boundaries and their size. Density is going to refer to the number of individuals within that population per unit area or the volume of the area. And dispersion is how they are spaced throughout the boundaries of that general area. Um, it is for the most part, pretty much impossible or um, impractical um, to just count up all the number of individuals making up a population. So statistics comes into play and we use sampling techniques to estimate densities and population sizes. Um, we're gonna do this talking about with the mark recapture method by using um, an, basically an index of population size. Um, you could do that or you could use all samples, but we're gonna focus on that last one right now. Um, so what scientists will do is they will capture, they will tag, and then they will release um, some of the individuals present in the population. They will give those individuals an opportunity to mix back in, and then they will capture a second set of, a second set sample of individuals and identify how many of them are marked previously. And then they will use that information to estimate population size by taking the product of the number of individuals in the initial sample and the number of individuals in the second sample and dividing that product by the number that were marked. So density is going to kind of be an interplay between when individuals are added to populations and when individuals are removed. And there's a couple ways that can happen. It can happen from immigration and it can happen from emigration. Immigration and in new individuals enter, emigration, individuals move out. It can also happen from birth and from death. So birth and immigration will add individuals to your population, while death and immigration will remove them. So we talked about dispersion patterns a little bit earlier. Environmental and social factors will influence these. In clumped dispersion, we will have individuals kind of grouped together in patches within their area that might have an influence on what resources are available, behaviors. Uniform dispersion is when the individuals are distributed pretty much evenly throughout that given area. Um, and one factor that may have played a role with that is um, just trying to provide defense against individuals um, that um, might want to take over set territory. And then a random dispersion um, where everybody is found is truly happenstance. Um, each individual is independent of the other. There's nothing pushing them towards one another, and there's nothing pushing them away from one another. So there you see clumped, uniform, and random. Um, demographics is looking at statistics um, for a population and seeing how they are um, going through changes over time. Death rates and birth rates are definitely ones that we tend to look at. A life table shows us um, survival patterns um, by age. Uh, we tend to look at it in terms of cohorts. And so we're going to look at buildings, ground squirrels. And if you look at this particular table, you will see that there are roughly the same number of females as males uh, from zero to one, but that um, the males tend to pass away a little bit earlier. The last um, male in this particular table um, from the data that was collected um, lived between five and six years while the females lived up to nine to 10 years. But you can kind of see how the number that are alive at the beginning of each year are decreasing over those um, periods of time. Survivorship curves are a way we can look at that data that's present in a life table. And what we see for the building ground squirrels is that it's a pretty constant death rate. So there's basically three ways we could look at um, survivorship curves um, from life tables. 
we could have a type two, which is what we see with the building ground squirrels, a constant death rate over the organism's lifespan. A type one is when we see fairly low death rates in early and middle ages and an increase among older ages. That would be what we see typically with humans. And then type three, you have really high death rates for the young um, and you have a much lower death rate for the survivors. And again, there's gonna be variations between these. So there you can see the building squirrels, how the females are um, going to, they didn't drop off as rapidly as the males. They were able to live for a little bit longer period of time. And then there's the type one, type two, and type three survivor um, ship curves. One being human, two being the squirrels, and three being um, a mollusk, I believe. Sorry, I didn't look it up again, but um, again, an uh, a aquatic animal. Reproductive rates. Um, Females are going to play a key role in examining reproductive rates since they are the ones that either carry um, or provided um, the um, egg or embryo that was able to produce the offspring. Um, reproductive table gives us age-specific summaries of those reproductive rates. When were they able to reproduce at how, what ages? And it is able to describe the reproductive patterns present in that population. So for the building's ground squirrels, we see that um, initially from zero to one years of age, they were not weaning litters. But then pretty much after that, one to two, over half were weaning litters. And 90% or more were weaning litters between two and five years of age. And then once we got to that point, um, all individuals that were still alive, granted there weren't as many females as what we saw previously, were weaning litters. So we're gonna look at two types of models. Exponential model is the first one. And this is looking at things basically in fantasy land, um, studying population growth in an idealized situation. Um, it's helping us to understand capacity of species to be able to increase and what conditions might help them be able to increase exponentially. So if we are wanting to look at changes in population size over periods of time, we would want to account for the births and the immigration um, and take away from that the number of deaths and the number of emigrants. If we ignore the immigrants and the emigrants, basically it would be birth rate minus death rate. So if we wanted to focus on that, just looking at birth rate minus death rate, assuming that the immigration and emigration aren't going to play a huge role, our population growth rate would just be the difference between those. Um, to determine the value of B and D, we, were we aren't going to count up again every single individual that's present in a population. We determine the average number of births and deaths per individual and multiply it by the population size that's present to get the birth and the, um, the number for births and the number for deaths. So if we wanted to revise this particular value, make sure I got this right. Yep. Um, so if we were going to revise it, so you see how we said that um, the number of births is going to be your birth rate over the year times the number of your population. Um, so that's just substituting in BN for big B and MN for big D. Uh, we can then determine what the rate of increase would be because delta N over delta T would basically be um, that rate of increase. And since they both have a value of N, that would just be B minus M. Um, zero population growth is when your birth rate and your death rate are the same. So you didn't have an increase on one side or the other. And if that is the case, we could use that to find instantaneous growth rate. Um, exponential population growth rate, again, is idealized circumstances. And so this is when the increase is maximized as much as possible. Um, it's going to result in a J-shaped curve. We do see this in some populations that are rebounding because there have been changes in their surroundings that have allowed them to grow without any restrictions. So we can see kind of there the, the letter J that we're referring to with the exponential growth curve. And there's the elephants that were no longer being hunted. So they were able to grow quite quickly and the population increased dramatically. The logistic model is a little bit more realistic. It's not absolute, um, but it basically shows how the population will grow 
until it's getting closer to its carrying capacity. Um, the carrying capacity, which we're going to refer to as K, is going to be dependent on what resources are available in the environment. Um, that's going to limit how many individuals within that um, can live within that population. So the exponential growth um, is, again, not going to be able to be sustained for an extended period of time. Um, accounting for what resources are present is going to be a little bit more realistic, and that's where carrying capacity is going to come into play. So with the logistic growth model, the rate of increase is going to decrease as your carrying capacity is getting closer to it. So if we look at that exponential model and we account for the fact that we're going to slow down as we get closer to that carrying capacity, um, we would generate a sigmoid curve, an S-shaped graph, okay? Um, so there's some data kind of showing you what those changes are going to look like. And that's more of, of a graphical representation. You can see the exponential graph, exponential growth in blue, the logistic growth in red. That as we start to get closer to that carrying capacity K value, our curve, the number of, of individuals in our population starts to, it's still growing, but it's just not, the rate at which it's growing is decreasing. So, um, depending on where your population is, you may see um, populations that are going to fit more in the J curve, or you're going to see ones that might fit more in the S curve. Um, some populations are going to go past the K value and then will come back down. And then there are some populations that don't fit um, the, J, uh, the exponential model or the logistic model. And then we have ones that show this alley effect um, that aren't able to survive or reproduce very effectively if their size is too small. Um, realistically speaking, neither of these models are going to 100% fit populations. Um, this model is a little more realistic in terms of giving us an idea as to whether a population would be able to continue to grow or not. Um, and this is um, what one way conservation biologists are able to estimate, estimate excuse me, um, the size of a population that is needed um, before a population would go extinct. So there's your um, graphs for the paramecium in the lab and the daphnia. You can see the paramecium falls really closely to that logistic um, model, while the daphnia is all over the place. Life history um, are the traits that will impact on its being, um, ability to reproduce, its schedule of reproduction, and its survival. Um, the factors that will play a role are the age at which reproduction begins, how often it's able to reproduce, and the number of offspring that are produced. Um, these um, traits are um, have an evolutionary basis. Um, we, um, it comes into play with the development, the physiology, and the organism's behavior. So there are some species that show semi-parity, Big Bang reproduction, they um, are able to reproduce only once and then they pass away. And then there are ones that are a terra parity um, that are able to repeatedly reproduce. Um, if you are in an environment that has quite a lot of variables that are undergoing constant change, um, very unpredictable, your um, species is more likely to favor that semel parity. While if your environment is a little more dependable, a little bit more assured, you're more likely to have that species exhibit a tarot parity. Um, other factors that are going to play a role are resources. Um, if you only have so much in terms of your resources, um, that's going to impact on how you're able to reproduce. So one example we have is with European kestrels. Um, there are plants that produce large numbers of small seeds, not expecting all of them to make it. Some of them will though, and then be able to reproduce. And then there are plants that don't make nearly as many seeds, but they make larger seeds. And so those seeds have more energy. And so a greater number of them should be able to be established as seedlings and to be able to survive. So K selection, density dependent selection, is going to take place when the life history traits are sensitive to the size of your population and density. R selection, density independent selection, is looking for traits that are going to maximize reproduction. Um, again, these are 
not absolutes in any way, but it is one way to examine um, the evolution of life history. So there's a couple of examples of your R selection um, and then your K selection. Factors that regulate population growth tend to be density dependent. Um, what factors will stop your population from growing indefinitely? And why do you see some populations that have fluctuations while others are able to stay more stable? If you are in a density independent population, your density does not affect your birth or death rate. But if you are in a density dependent population, your population density will have a large impact on your birth and your death rates. So in this particular graph, um, when you are an in density independent um, death rate, you're going to stay pretty status quo. You're not dependent on your population density in any way. So that's why you just see the horizontal line. But if you are in a density dependent population, if your population numbers are low, um, then you're going to have a higher birth rate than you are um, your density independent death rate. And the population will continue to grow. You'll may, um, um, more and more um, individuals will um, be um, born and allowed to grow until you reach that equilibrium density. And once you have reached that equilibrium density and you have even more members of your population and you don't necessarily have the resources to be able to support them, then you're going to see um, that your density independent death rate is going to be greater than your density dependent birth rate and your population is going to shrink. Um, you're going to have more members pass away until you are able to reestablish that equilibrium density. So these are examples of negative feedback so that your population doesn't get so out of control that now you're fighting for resources and you're not able to continue on with that population. Um, so factors that can play a role. Um, we talked about resources. Territoriality can play a role. Um, disease, predation, toxic waste, and intrinsic factors. Okay. So there's sheep producing lamb. You can see as the number of individuals in that population increase, the number of young sheep producing lambs decreases. Resource competition. Um, if you are not, if you do not have enough resources to be able to support um, individuals, you're not going to um, have additional individuals or the number of individual, number of new individuals join that particular population, that rate is going to decrease. Toxic waste, um, that can play a role in regulating your population size. Maybe it cuts back on your resources, or maybe it is going to cause your death rates to increase. Um, predators um, might feed preferentially on a particular species that too can influence um, your population size. Intrinsic factors, physiolog physiological, um, sometimes um, mothers um, have some sort of innate sense that one of their offspring is not going to be able to survive. And so they will cast it off um, so they can have a better chance of allowing the rest of their offspring to be able to survive. Um, we talked about territory. Competing for territory could limit your density. If you don't have as much space, um, you're not going to have as much room for all the individuals. Uh, again, if you have competition for it, it could be predators that are coming in as well. Disease. Um, this is quite um, timely. Um, population density can influence the health and survival of your organisms. In dense populations, pathogens can spread more rapidly. Um, and that's what we're seeing right now, unfortunately, with COVID-19 um, in areas where there are lots of individuals that are in smaller um, buildings or environments. Um, it is making it much easier for that pathogen to be able to spread. So population dynamics is looking at both biotic and abiotic factors that can cause some population size fluctuations. Um, there are more longer term population studies that have um, explored the hypothesis that large mammal populations are typically stable and they have um, actually challenged those hypotheses. 
Um, we've seen also that weather and predator population can affect your population size. Um, it's uh, the example you've got here, Isle Royale, there's a moose population there that collapsed during a harsh winter. And when that took place, um, the wolf numbers, so the moose were their predators, um, went sky high. Population cycle. Some populations undergo regular boom and bust cycles. Um, we're seeing that right now with cicadas. Um, lynx populations tend to follow the 10 year boom and bust cycle of hare populations. Um, so why might this happen? We're gonna look at three hypotheses that would explain that. So there you can see that as the hares increase, so do the lynx. First one is that the hares population cycle is going to be based on a cycle of winter food supply. So if you increase your food supplies, you shouldn't see these cycles um, present. You should see the cycle cease. Um, so food was provided, then the population got bigger, but it still continued to cycle. So this hypothesis was not supported. In the second cycle, um, the Harris population cycle was driven um, based on predators. So in this study, 90% um, of the hares were killed by predators. Um, so as you have more predators, you're going, um, more hares would be needed so that that species could survive that population. Um, data supported this hypothesis. And then the third one is that it's linked to sunspot cycles, uh, which is going to affect your light quality, which is going to affect the hare's food. Um, and it's thought that this too might have an influence on the hare's population size. So the results from all three of these different um, exp um, hypo hypotheses that were tested, predation and sunspot activity, um, will have influences on the number of individuals that are present in a hare population, but that food availability does not play as big of a role. Immigration, emigration, and metapopulations. So this is looking at a group of amoebas that are able to emigrate and forage better than individual ones. So metapopulations are populations that are linked by these two um, events, immigration and emigration. If you have higher levels of immigration and higher survival rates, your population is more likely to be more stable. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, the human population is not growing exponentially anymore, but it is still increasing. Um, we are limited by the resources and all those other factors we talked about. Um, it was growing fairly slowly until about 1650, and then it started growing exponentially. Um, but our rate of growth has slowed down um, in the past 50 years. Okay, so again, this first one, you got BCE, you got the plague in there, and then you see the huge skyrocket in population. And even within that skyrocket, though, you can still see that although we are having increases, our increases are diminishing. Um, to maintain population st stability, um, sorry, stability, um, human populations are going to exist in either of these two configurations. You're either going to have zero population growth because you have both a high birth rate and a high death rate, or because you have a low birth rate and a low death rate. Um, a demographic transition is when you move from the first one where they're both high to the second one where they're both low. This is going to happen when you are in um, areas where healthcare quality is, is sound, um, improved educational access, especially for women. And what we're seeing is that um, the global population growth is concentrated more now in your developing countries. So age structure will play a role in examining what um, growth trends are looking like in a country, um, how many individuals, relatively speaking, are present at each age for both um, males and females, and this can kind of help to predict um, future growth trends. It also gives us a better idea of social conditions and being able to plan for future events. So with this first one, we see with Afghanistan, we see they're having rapid growth, lots of younger children, um, if zero to four at the bottom. So this would be an example of a pyramid. Um, and so because we are having way more 
um, individuals at the younger ages uh, as opposed to at the older ages. Um, we are having exponential growth take place in this particular example. Um, in the United States, we're undergoing um, slow growth. We have a stable population. Um, we have what we refer to more as a bell-shaped population, where relatively speaking, um, if you look down from zero to four up to, you know, into your 50s, I'm not saying it doesn't vary a little bit, but it's pretty consistent across the board. Um, and then after you get through the 50s, remember we talked about the type one survivorship curve, that um, as the, the age of the individuals in that population increased, uh, we saw a greater number of deaths as that age increased. And that's what you're seeing happen um, after you get out of the 60s or out of the 50s. Um, but it still takes quite a bit to get there. Whereas with Italy, we're not seeing a whole lot of growth. This curve is representing more of an urn shape. Um, if you look at the bottom, you see that they are having much fewer, um, their, their, the number of births um, is much smaller compared to what we saw with the rapid growth and the slow growth. And that, that number is saying small. Um, and then as you get up into your middle ages, 30s, 40s, 50s, we have a greater number of individuals in the population at those middle ages. And then we're seeing it substantially decrease, but not to the numbers that we saw with the rapid and slow growth. Um, so when your birth rate is falling below your death rate, you are um, typically seeing what we call a declining population. Um, infant mortality, life expectancy um, will also play roles. These are going to vary depending on what, um, what resources are available to you in your country. Um, they are not, they are snapshot and they are not an absolute, um, the only figure you should look at to examine what's taking place with the human condition in a given country. So in your industrialized countries, we see that infant mortality rates are low and life expectancy rates are high as opposed to the less industrialized countries. So how many humans can um, be supported by our biosphere, the global carrying capacity? Um, population ecologists expect that we should be able to hold approximately 8 to 11 billion people in 2050. Um, what exactly the carrying capacity is um, on the Earth for humans is not known, but it's estimated to be anywhere between 10 and 15 billion. So ecological footprint, um, this concept is basically giving us an idea as to what land and water resources are needed to sustain people in a nation. And we can use this to kind of look at the earth's carrying capacity. Um, we vary in our footprint size. And so as a result, um, our ecological capacity will vary as well. It's dependent on food, space, non-renewable resources, waste buildup. Uh, but this is something we actually can impact um, through social changes. We've been seeing a lot of this um, with everything going on um, in terms of how air quality has improved and how um, there's other um, resources that aren't being used nearly to the extent they were previously um, since we've all been staying at home. Um, but you can see that North America is the Mac Daddy winner for the amount of energy that we use, um, more than 300 gigajoules, um, whereas we've got over in Asia and in Europe, anywhere in Australia, between 150 to 300. Uh, where I've gone to in Africa, they are at less than 10 gigajoules.